Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really grateful to be invited to a cause that's very close to my heart. Now, I know what you're all expecting. I'm going to tell you that the dietitians are wonderful and, and are great. And I know also what your response is going to be, that they are not sufficient and we, we would love to refer to a dietitian, but there's no dietitian in our area. So hopefully, maybe I've tried to do the presentation in a way that it's not only what we could offer, but possibly resources that may be useful that you could use in your practice if you don't have a dietitian. So I'm giving the presentation knowing that there is a problem with certain areas. Now, we we'll just found the right button. I think in regards to guidelines, all of you should know the NICE guidelines that we've got and the RCPCH guidelines in terms of food allergy. And I've highlighted within the RCPCH guidelines, we have that a part of the guidelines are in terms of standard management that nutritional support should be given by a registered dietitian. Uh, and then in terms of complex management, specialist pediatric allergy dietitian. And again, that's a very loaded point to put into a guideline because the question is, what is a specialist allergy dietitian? And there are so many complex food allergic children. Why can't a dietitian, any dietitian, just in fact manage them? From a dietetic perspective, the nice thing is, I think, as a dietitian, we fit in to a multidisciplinary team, and unfortunately, there's no, no pointer. But this is a publication that was uh, published by Bodo Nigerman, indicating the multidisciplinary interaction between allergology, dermatology, and gastroenterology. The nice thing about a dietitian is that we actually cover all the areas. And even if you don't sit within the same practice, what I often find is that the dietitian is, in fact, the glue person. For example, I've just come from my clinic today. I had a child with non-IgE-mediated allergies with quite bad eczema, had skin prick testing, was seen by a gastroenterologist, just seen by an allergist. And the mother today said to me, and we fry and butter. So I'm like, okay, yes, that's a problem. And yes, she has those biscuits and she didn't associate it. But when I looked at her clinically, her eczema was bad, so my feedback was was number one going to be to the dermatologist. I sent her back saying you have to see the dermatologist. I went to the gastroenterologist saying actually this mother, st this child is still symptomatic because you've got milk. So it's a nice way of communicating. The dietitians are involved in all processes in, from diagnosis with an allergy-focused history. Um, we always find that we supplement from the doctor's perspective, and I've already given you example from that perspective. In regards to non-IgE-mediated allergy, we do the elimination diet uh, that helps you with the diagnosis. The food challenges, and I know those are tricky, uh, especially with the services, and there are long waiting lists in regards to food challenges. We do nutrition assessments in regards to growth, uh, vitamins and minerals, management of the elimination diets itself. It's always great to talk after Paul because uh, he's obviously a dietitian himself and to be able to say th the labeling advice and to try to make it practical, the advice on, the, uh, on nuts and chocolates and what you can look after, really that is what your dietitian specializes in. And finally also when a child comes to tolerance and the induction of food. I want to make a case, I know it's not always a possibility, that dietitians should be part of a multidisciplinary team. Um, one of our colleagues, uh, and Karina Fenter was the main supervisor here, Sally Denton really did a study looking at pros and cons for dietitians to be part of a multidisciplinary team clinic and a one-stop shop versus you visiting dietitian as a separate entity. And surveyed 236 children with food hypersensitivity, 162 were seen by dietitian and 74 by pediatrician. 50, 70% 
Almost 60% of parents reported difficulties with dietary management until they actually saw a dietitian. 67% indicated that an early appointment would be helpful. Doesn't come as a surprise. And I know that there are many models now that some of the dietitians are working at where actually the dietitian is the first port of call um, and to see also about the cost effectiveness. What this study nicely demonstrated is that there certainly seems to be, if we see, take the pediatrician um, at 215 pounds, what we estimated on the cost in 2014, to a dietitian, 53 pounds 21 for an appointment, versus then if they were actually seen in a multidisciplinary setting, then your cost actually would come down. What was unique, and we are just working at it because I had two years of working in uh, Switzerland, we had dietitians actually within the consultant's uh, room, so we actually sat in and took the food uh, allergy focused history with the consultant and whilst they did the skin prick testing we already did a dietary history intake so it was also a model that worked really well. So what evidence do we actually have in regards to food allergy that having a dietitian makes a difference? There are about four to five studies currently um, that show this. I'm just going to show a couple of them. One major study from uh, uh, Roberta Canani indicated, uh, did a multi-centered, uh, non-randomized study and looked as a primary outcome, growth in children with food allergies. And found that total energy intake of children with food allergy increased after their consultation. There was significant improvement, not only in weight, but also in height parameters. And laboratory biomarkers, they looked at uh, essential fatty acids, which is an interesting biomarker to look at, as well as vitamin D, which makes perfect sense, and found that those improved as well. So that's one study. Another study is a much more closer to home. It's one of my MSc students, Miriam Tarkin, who did an MSc project looking looking at uh, a pre-assessment of nutritional intake of patients before they saw a dietitian and after dietitian, and basically in a nutshell showed that before seeing a dietitian and after seeing a dietitian, the variety of the foods they introduced was huge. And uh, a lot of people say, well, that's absolutely normal, Roseanne, because as you progress during weaning, you're expecting the variety to increase. But what she showed is that the variety in food allergens that they were actually negative to increase, because that's a big issue, is that once you've got one allergy, and even if somebody says, but actually, you're absolutely fine to now have another nut. Once you had that anaphylaxis, for example, to peanut and somebody else says to you, well, you can have walnut, it does require a lot of motivation which products to have, and that's what she really nicely showed. She also showed that in Z scores, their weight uh, for height and height for age and weight for age increased significantly in the cohort. So there clearly is some um, De uh, evidence that it does make a difference also in the UK. Now, this is what NICE says that for babies and young children with suspected cow's milk protein allergy, offer affordance advice, breastfeeding, and seek advice from a dietitian with appropriate competencies. The question here is, for me as a dietitian, is what is an appropriate competency for a dietitian? And how do we actually know what an appropriate competency is? And I think it's the same question that all of you ask yourself uh, on a daily basis. It doesn't matter if you're a nurse versus a physician. Is Am I competent to see this child? Now, we have dietitians dealing with pediatrics, with allergy, and we have dietitians that overlap, that look at the adolescents. Um, for example, Karina Fento has now moved away. She, she sees both pediatrics and adults. I only see pediatrics until teenage, and then they switch over. But there's another aspect to it, is that we have dietitians working in hospital, secondary care, where doing allergy is just, for example, one clinic a day, versus somebody like me, where this is my bread and butter. And then we have dietitians in the community who really take the brunt of our mild to moderate allergic children, I would say, that take the majority of our cow's milk allergy, certainly. There are currently no dietetic competencies specifically for dietitians. We have adopted the competencies from the RCPCH for general medical practice. 
The IACI board is currently working on competencies for allied healthcare professionals, those are generic, which we will adopt. So that brings a problem in that sense is that to say a dietitian with appropriate competencies, if we don't know what the competencies are, makes it very difficult. What we as a specialist group have done is we developed what we call a competency-based course just for cow's milk protein allergy, and it's based on the RCPCH competencies. It's based on uh, contact, pre-course assessment, post-course assessment with lots of patient work, and in fact, Unlike other study days where you get a certificate, irrespective if you've absorbed the knowledge, this competency is based on the fact that if you have not passed, you actually do not get a certificate as a dietitian. So they have to redo it until they actually show they're competent to base these cases. It's still not ideal, but at least it's a model. And for those of you who are dietitians, that's where the next course is. It goes around the country. But it's a model that we've been asked now by the Royal College of Nursing and also for health visitors whether that's something that can be adjusted. There are many courses like these ones where I'm sure if I asked who are dietitians around, we'll have a couple of hands that you can attend to build up your knowledge in regards to allergy. And of course, we have two MSCs in food hypersensitivity, which is open, or MSCs in allergy, which have got food hypersensitivity modules. One is in Southampton. Uh, me together with Isabel Skipala lead the um, module for the MSC at Imperial. College, um, and I, we have the module next week, Monday and Tuesday. I know it's short notice, but we have two or three spots still open if anybody wants to come. You do not need to be, it's open to anybody, a, a dietitian, a physician to come and attend, and you do not need to do it as an MSc. You can do as a postgraduate certificate as well. One of the biggest complaints that I have is about resources. And that's really where we've tried to invest as a food allergy specialist group. So we are the first group that have really got um, diet sheets that have been developed by the groups that are free of charge for all registered dietitians that have gone through not only rigorous assessment from the dietitians, but have gone out to parents. So we have actually had feedback from parents on them, and we have also had allergies. So these can be downloaded. You have to be a BDA member to get access to them, and they also comply with the NHS information standard in regards to font, et cetera, et cetera. Then there are BDA food fact sheets. Now, the BDA food fact sheets in fact, are free to download for anybody that's not a dietitian. And those fact sheets, uh, just to give you an example, for example, this is the milk allergy one. They are one pages that we've developed, which you can print off as PDFs. Uh, they've got, uh, so milk allergy, we have got food hypersensitivity. We have uh, got calcium, what, uh, what foods are high in calcium. So those in regards to first line approach, and I know we're focusing a lot on milk allergy, but that's where the majority of requirements and need has been identified from a primary care perspective. Now, you didn't think I was just going to do dietitians are wonderful and great, and I thought one of the nicest things would be to actually go through a couple of cases to maybe demonstrate how a dietitian in those cases could be really helpful. So this is a nine-month-old child that is breastfed and has IgE-mediated allergy, had lip swelling and a rash three times after introducing yogurt at six months, and has a skin prick test of 12 millimeters, and at that stage, the skin prick test showed soya 4 millimeters, peanut 10 millimeters, but there prior to the first exposure to yogurt um, at that stage, no symptoms of any allergy. Mom needs to go back to work and she said, she, I just cannot maintain breastfeeding, which is a common <coughs> problem that we have. And of course, we want to keep breastfeeding as far as possible. So the question here is, how can a dietitian help in this case? The first aspect that anybody should realize is that at nine months old, a child that has been breastfed, this is a, quite a complex category to get a hypoallergenic formula into. Because I always explain it, it's like having the best chocolate in one case and the, the child knowing the chocolate is in that cupboard and somebody offering them some cheap alternative. So if the mother is around, it's really difficult to then decide, okay, 
I'll just have the stuff that, in my opinion, the child's opinion tastes quite foul. So that is the first aspect to take into account. And the second aspect is how the practical advice that the dietitian needs to give. So we have two aspects here. Which formula should we give? In this case, should it be an amino acid formula? Should it be an extensively hydrolyzed formula? And if I choose one, what would be more successful? The guidelines, is, these are just a summary of the different guidelines, but in this case, um, all guidelines in a child that was breastfed, where the mother wasn't on an elimination diet, where we just had uh, on first exposure symptoms and the child is growing well, you'd go for an extensively hydrolyzed formula. Now, the question is, what formula in theory could help me, or what are the clues? Which are those things that a dietitian might help you? So when we look at this chart, we had strict, we didn't do maternal elimination, so this child only presented symptoms with cow's milk formula, so we know that this is the right decision, and that's exactly what BSACI and, and MAP guidelines say, which I really always refer to and are much more extensive than the presentation. But what are you going to look out for? So the first question is, there are extensively hydrolyzed formulas that contain medium chain triglycerides. Does this child need that? And the indication for these type of fats would be only if you've got severe diarrhea and you've got fat malabsorption, which, which this child does not have. The second aspect is these feeds, uh, medium chain triglycerides, affect the palatability. So that's something you do not want to have a feed that has got a medium chain triglyceride. For this child, it's not required and also it may affect the taste. The next question is, what about a formula that contains lactose? So we have two formulas in the UK that contain lactose. The lactose is clean, so it does, is not contaminated with cow's milk. The reality is lactose improves the taste. Okay, so that already possibly you can say, okay, maybe I need to think about a formula that contains lactose. This child is above six months of age. Do I actually need a number two formula or can I just give a one formula because some companies have got form other follow on formulas, others don't and that depends on the dietary intake because it depends, does the child need more calcium, does the child need more vitamin D and in particular iron. Then the next question is, would I want prebiotics? What is the evidence? Because it's, we have a couple of products here. Do we need in this child really prebiotics? Does it affect the taste at all? And no, normally any prebiotic ad, uh, um, additions doesn't affect the taste. And the final question is, what about probiotics? We now have a feed that has got probiotics. And how can a dietitian help? Well, the first aspect here is that a feed that's got tons probiotics, you can't mix a corn according to the WHO mixing guidelines. So you can't mix it at 70 degrees. It has to be below 40, and just that you know this has been approved. So those are the factors where a dietitian could really help you, in this case, make a choice. And for a child like this, if the child is growing well, has got a good diet, I would most probably go for an extensively hydrolyzed formula with lactose in it. And if they have got sufficient uh, iron and vitamin D, I do not see uh, the necessity of going to a follow-on formula. So that is, those are the decisions you can make. So let's go to case two. This is baby F, is 10 months of age, and he has severe eczema and food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome to multiple foods. And, and for those of you who've not been exposed to it, I saw a child today who had uh, ended up in A&E four times, twice admitted with uh, severe dehydration, and only by the fourth time was a diagnosed. And in fact, this child has got f pies to not only cow's milk, but pear and potato on repeated occasions. So quite rare one to see like that. But it's a very scary situation. And if you went onto Dr. Google, what you get on FPIs, and we have an FPI support group in the UK, which I support, but we get all kinds of other advice where any type of symptoms seem to be fitting into FPIs. So a lot of times these ch parents avoid so many foods, it's really complicated. On top of this, this child has got faltering growth, is on a hypoallergenic formula already, and he currently needs to avoid milk, soya, egg, nut, wheat, rice, oat, and sweet potato. So how can your dietitian help in this case? 
me see if that comes up. So, of course, the dietary intake assessment is is the cornerstone for this child because in this patient I would expect that uh, there would be excessive dietary elimination. In addition to that is to ensure that what they're avoiding is optimal because as Paul has already said to you is there is real angst around dietary elimination and by actually doing it properly I believe that you provide them with a, a comfort blanket to say actually I'm empowering you, you can make the decision yourself. The next as aspect of it, anybody can actually say to you what you can't eat. You really can find a lot of things on the internet. The clue is what a child can actually eat. And for a patient like this, you'd be really wanting to provide some product information saying this is what you can have, this is what you need to look out for. And that's the key to a good dietary assessment and dietary input is not the don'ts, it's the do's. Then practical guidelines for the nursery, because that is also very scary. Recipes of what they can do at home, how to increase the energy and protein content, the supplementation. This is a study, I hope I can show you, it's looking at the trouble by caregivers and the results of food allergy during a week before survey, and it looked at the trouble ranked if they were minimally troubled, moderately troubled, and extremely troubled. And you'll see one of the aspects that really came out in 35% of children frightened that the child will have a reaction. And f is one of those, like anaphylaxis, although we don't have death, there is still the perception that this is uh, really, really severe and they're scared. The next aspect is concern for the child's health, 30%, so a third of the children that caused uh, trouble and extremely troubled, almost 30%. Concern for the child's nutrition ranked from 45, so 50%, to 20% for extremely worried. And extra time in spending on meal preparation. That's a huge aspect where, in this case, with multiple food allergies, a dietitian could help. And I've just put a couple of products, not that I'm marketing, but some of these are based on coconut, some of them are based on, um, uh, on quinoa and buckwheat. So, uh, so those are the products that you can say these are safe and the child can have it. This child also has got growth faltering. So we know that almost 50% of energy and protein comes from a hypoallergenic formula. So most people always think, okay, fine, if I need to get some calories in, I look at the formula. And you're right, if a child was consuming sufficient volume, then in majority of children, they achieve their requirements. So in this child that is on a hypoallergenic formula that's not growing, some of the techniques that uh, the dietitians would use or that are recommended and used is for example, the addition of carbohydrate and flat blends, uh, and some of them give up to five grams per 100 milliliters, or the concentration of the formula. But the reality, as an allergy dietitian would tell you, doing that is old practice. We don't do that in children per se with faltering growth, and also we don't do it in our food allergic children. We try to find other solutions, i.e. there are products now around that are energy dense, that are uh, one kilocalorie for feed and are extensively hydrolyzed and, 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 and. And the reason we don't do that anymore is because you, uh, if you add, for example, modular addition, then what happens, you disturb the energy protein ratio and you provide too much energy and too little protein so when they gain weight, we all pat ourselves on the back, but in fact what you're gaining is fat. So for long run, that's not good. Similarly, if you can concentrate the feed too high, and a lot of you will know that sometimes if you move from uh, the one plus feeds that are one kilocalorie, they suddenly develop diarrhea or vomiting, and that's uh, the osmolality change goes from 350 to 550, and as one of the feeds goes to almost 700 if you've got flavored or unflavored, and anybody working in gastro knows that that is looking for trouble with a child that already has got gastro problems. So those are the factors that a dietitian could help you and saying we could look at food uh, to increase the calories, we could also look at feeds that are currently available. 
We also have a publication just for you, I'm not going to go through that, to give you some guidelines on practical management for protein energy malnutrition. This is specifically for cow's milk protein allergy because that's what we see in the majority or when it's reported, the majority are cow's milk allergic. So let's go to the next case. Um, Patient V is 15 months of age and continues on an amino acid formula and has a milk and peanut allergy. Current guidelines suggest in theory that a hypoallergenic formula should continue until two years of age. But this is expensive and I think this is a question that all of you have that by one year of age we need to review them and saying, is this appropriate? Do I stop this child from, uh, uh, from this feed and go to an over-the-counter formula? So how can a dietitian help you in this case? So first of all, dietitians should be aware that there are studies indicating what the deficiencies are in regards to formula and no formula. So this is a study we performed and we looked at the children that were on nutrient intake, not on bloods, so just on intake. What the difference were if they had a formula and if they didn't have, and a lot of people just stop at calcium and vitamin D. But in fact, there are lots of other micronutrients, especially if you've got mul multiple allergic infants, where you will find a statistical difference in regards to intake. A dietitian would also tell you that the majority of these over-the-counter milks uh, vary hugely in calories. If you look at how low the calories are, but one of the biggest problems is protein. So if you think about a normal infant formula or, or breastfed, I've got your full cream cow's milk. So uh, at a, the hypoallergenic formulas have between 1.7 and 1.8 grams per 100 milliliters. So you can see what the difference is. It's a lot of time just liquid white water. So, but a dietitian could also tell you that the new Oatly foamable is 60 kilocalories per 100 milliliters and contains one gram of protein. So, you know, there are alternatives. We don't need to be stuck. We can change and it can actually have a cost saving effect, especially if the child is growing really well. So let's get to the last two cases. This is baby L, is one year of age and has non-IG mediated allergies. And you gave the milk map ladder that everybody knows. And mom said that she's not keen on the foods, high in sugar content. That's the biggest complaint that we have. And you can see the first up to you get to shepherd's pie. It's for a one year old sugar, sugar and sugar. So that is a problem. And the other thing is she said, well, we also don't have lasagna on a regular basis. And that's, that is, common. So here is where a dietitian can actually help you in saying, okay, I understand that because I can get the supplementary document. I know how much gram of pro milk protein is in there. I can actually adjust it. I can provide you with a biscuit recipe that has got no sugar in it. It just has fruit in it. So that's where it becomes really practical because what we don't want is them just to skip steps and you have a more severe reaction, but it's actually making it practical. And here we're looking at a baby P as eczema is four months of age. He's skin prick negative to all allergens. Mom has got eczema as well and dad suffers from asthma. You know about the leap and would like to advise them on weaning and early introduction of nuts. So all of you know, should know about the eczema being part eczema and nut allergy. So you would like to introduce this. And one of the biggest issues that I have, I have parents coming to me and saying, my baby's four months of age and I has not had food and now I went to see a doctor and he said, just give them peanut butter. I have got no other foods. I've had children who have, uh, have had hazelnut butter, peanut butter, uh, walnut butter, but have had no food by the time they came to see me and just have these teaspoons and sucking on the nut butters. So as a dietitian again here, first of all, we know from the papers what to give and, and in the appendix of the LEAP papers, there's some wonderful advice from our LEAP dietitians of how to introduce this. But also, as, as dietitians, we have a pragmatic approach in saying, we do need to get some food in there. It's not just nuts that we need to get in there. And so that's why it's also really helpful to have a dietitian. Um, my last case, and I hope the video works. No, the video doesn't work. Um, I might just go through it in the interest of time. 
But as a child with non-IG mediated allergy with severe feeding difficulties, meal times take up to one and a half hours. Gagging on dual textures will have pieces if he's self-fed. But mom has stopped working and we see that in many families just to feed this child. And the question here is how can a dietitian help? Because these are the families that go back and go back to healthcare professionals saying it's still not fine. They are the p parents that often become really depressed. Now, the prevalence of feeding difficulties is really high. 30% uh, physician documented, 40% parent documented in our prospective uh, study, which we've not published yet. But we found about 60% of children with non-IgE mediated allergies have got some variation of feeding difficulties. So. The, the underlying medical condition needs to be managed, and that comes back to working with our allergists, our dermatologists, because a lot of time a child that's scratching the constantly or still refluxing, those type of aspects are not conducive for feeding. The behavioral aspect should be assessed as well. Where is this child at that stage? And we generally keep the advice really simple, reducing meal times, ensuring that distractions are minimal, keep the meal time environment relaxed and that's most probably the hardest. I tell the mothers to go around the corner and scream there and I prescribe a lot of glasses of wine just for them just to calm down because that feeds into the child's anxiety. The textures, of course, dietitians can give some basic texture, but I often have uh, get speech and language therapists, and that's the nice link that the dietitians often, when it comes to food allergy, link in with our other allied healthcare professionals, see what the child can eat, see the textures they can tolerate, and then provide advice. I'm not going to go through further details because I do want to leave just a couple of minutes for questions. So in conclusion, I think a dietitian is an essential part of allergy service, but we acknowledge the fact that many areas struggle to have sufficient dietetic support. And for that reason, we are trying to get more and more leaflets that can be just printed out. And we are also trying to do more educations of our GPs so that healthcare settings in primary care are more empowered to also give some basic advice. We are part of a multidisciplinary team and there's some evidence of this working. We practice at different levels and I think the question of what can your allergy dietitian do for you is a very loaded question because it's the same for any other practice. You have dietitians practicing at different levels. It all depends on the severity and the complexity of the dietitians, but there are plenty of courses that a dietitian can go to that um, I see Jackie there and you know, we have She's, she's here and she's for a course, but she's in a different area. And that's the same for dietitians. They can come to these courses and learn to deal with, these di uh, with uh, food allergy. Dietitians have the skills, which we think potentially to reduce time and cost and hopefully quality of time. We've got a couple of studies that are on the go to try to see whether we can translate this in money. NHS is all about money, and I think if we can put some numbers to it, and in particular, quality of, uh, of life is one of our big aspects that we want to look at. And I'd like to end here, in time, I hope.